The church said, Amen. Amen. A prayer to stand firm in the battle, putting on the full armor of God. Yeah, the, the black prayer. I stepped on the other prayer mixing concrete yesterday. I put them on during worship and they were like this. I did. I've got these things. How many of you use reading glasses and, and you just got them laying everywhere? Yeah. Yeah. Like, to, if you haven't turned 50 yet, I'll be 52 this week, but if you haven't turned 50 yet, some advice, two things. If you're checking out and there's a $2 pair of reading glasses, <laughs> buy them. And if there's a bathroom near and you think it might be a while, use it. Oh, hallelujah. Aging up. I love it. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 14. Paul's talking to the church at Ephesus. And when I say I'm not going to recap today, I've been saying that. I'm still, do, I'm still doing it. I'm not recapping. So go back and listen if you haven't heard some of these, or you'll think that our church is not theologically and doctrinally correct. Verse 10. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the strategies, the attacks, the plan against your destiny of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore. Hence the title of this series, putting on the full armor of God, standing firm in the battle. Now, if you just focus on verse 14 of Ephesians, the verse in its entirety, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. And that's where we find ourselves again today is the breastplate of righteousness. And you have to remember the belt of truth. You can't separate truth and righteousness. And so if, the, if truth is out of whack, which unfortunately has happened in many churches today, Truth gets off, righteousness gets off. For without truth, there can be no true definition of righteousness. And we, we've proven that biblically. Uh, whether you believe that or not, doesn't matter. The Bible proves that. And so we looked at the imputed righteousness of God, and that happens when we put our faith in Jesus as the Messiah, that's salvation. It's imputed unto us the righteousness of Christ because of what God did for us by sending Jesus, his only son. Then we looked at the lifestyle of righteousness through obedience, and that's a spirit-led life. And then we jumped off uh, two weeks ago into cultivating the fruit of righteousness. Last week talked about the water, Ezekiel 47, ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, until we were in a water that we could no longer swim in. In other words, if I want the fruits of righteousness cultivated and produced in my life, I have to let go of control of my life. And, you know, that sounds hard, but let me just clue you in on something. We can't control anything. Just think about that for a second. So when it comes to the spiritual battle we're in, you've got to just submit to the Lord and let him have it all. And so we'll continue down that, that path today for Philippians chapter 1, 9 through 11, it should begin to be familiar to you guys. Paul says, in this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ, being, say it with me, filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory of and praise of God. So Paul's telling the church at Philippi, it is incumbent upon you as a child of God to be cultivating, producing, and at some point be 
filled with the fruits of righteousness. It is biblically incorrect to say that you can be saved and never change. I'm not saying it happens overnight, but I'm saying that, you know, like if you've, you've been walking with the Lord, you gave, you, you gave your heart to the Lord some time ago, and there's not been any change in your attitude, change in your lifestyle, change, then you got to come all the way back to the cross because Jesus didn't die for us just to give us a get out of hell free card. That's not salvation. He died so that he imputes righteousness unto us. And then we walk out that righteousness unto fruit. And that's what the breastplate does. The breastplate protects the process of the cultivating of the seed of the imputed seed of righteousness. So why is that important? Well, number one, the soul condition of the heart. Because remember, we are spirit, soul, and body. The soul references the heart. In the Bible, when you see the heart, you... The many times, most often, it's talking about the whole being of that person. God looks at David and says, he's a man after my own heart. Well, he then goes on to say, you're looking on the outer appearance. God looks upon the heart. Well, God's looking at who David is inside, your soul, who you are. Some parts of that, only God knows, or those closest to you, but that's the part of you that has emotions and that's, that's the soil of your life. And that is, that is what pulls from somewhere and something to be fed, to be watered. Well, here's what the Bible has to say. I'll just give you two verses about the condition of the heart. First of all, Proverbs 4.23 challenges us, warns us to guard your heart, keep your heart with all diligence, with all intensity, for out of it springs the issues of life. In other words, there, there's, you have to protect your heart. You have to. Bitterness tries to come in. You gotta protect your heart. So with diligence, with intensity, being intentional on guarding your heart, Jeremiah says this, and you know a lot of us don't wanna hear this, but it says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? You're like, what? Pastor Jason, that does not make me feel good. Well, first of all, I'm not here to make you feel good. I'm here to provoke you. What does this mean? Simply means that left to ourselves, without Christ, without the righteousness of Christ, without salvation, the heart's deceitful. If you don't believe that, look at the world today. But here's what's so awesome. We, we get all worked up about how our world in 2024, Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus a couple, you know, th thousands of years ago, we don't fight against flesh and blood, but the darkness of the rulers of this age. So this has been going on a long time, right? It's been going on since the devil got kicked out of heaven. So... Left to ourself, yes, the heart is deceitful. But praise be to God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because when we put our faith in Jesus, it's imputed un unto us as righteousness. Now, the breastplate then, now watch this. This is why this is important. The breastplate then put on correctly with the belt of truth held in place. In the natural, the breastplate would protect the heart, the lungs, the vital organs, right? The kill shot. The kill shot that would come at you, that's what that was for. The arrow that could slide, truth is off, the breastplate slides, and then vital organs are exposed. Well, the Bible says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. What's that tell me? It tells me the enemy has a weapon formed against me, and it's different than the one he has formed against you. And so the heart of the matter is just this. In spiritually speaking, the breastplate of righteousness is put on to protect the soul, to protect the heart, the soil of the heart. Because when the breastplate of righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, is protecting the process, 
then the soul is not looking for the things of the world to fill it. It's looking back to the spirit. And in the spirit is the imputed seed of righteousness. And so as it pulls back from the imputed seed of righteousness and and the work that Christ has done in our spirit, then what happens is there's a cultivation. Last week, it was the living water, John chapter 7. The living water in our soul begins to germinate the seed of righteousness because it's protected by the breastplate of righteousness. That's why every day you get up, you got to put on the full armor of God. What are you saying, Pastor Jason? I'm saying you got to put on Christ. Every day. Max, turn these up until they just squeak, please. Like, you, you have to squeak. That's a cool word. Every day, for we don't know the day that the arrow is pointed towards us. We we don't know the day the battle is going to rage like we never knew it could rage. We don't know the day the accident's going to happen because we always think it'll happen to someone else. We don't know. That's why every day we must put on the full armor of God. Amen? So you... You look at the process. So last week we looked at the living water and then into Ezekiel. I want to look today just just for a moment of how the seed of righteousness, the imputed seed of righteousness, it is it's cultivated through the living word of God and into the prepared soil of the heart. So Jesus is telling a parable over in Matthew chapter 13. You have your Bible, turn there. And I will tell you this, if you don't have a Bible, please let us get you one. They're free as long as you'll take care of it and read it. Uh, Most of you have five or six at home. Please bring your Bible to church, please. Here lately, you know, God's just been changing some things around. It's very hard for you to follow along if you don't have a Bible. So, um, and I would encourage you to get a, a Bible, like a Bible, because you may have noticed that for like two months you couldn't download our church app, right? We own, the, we own the content. We don't own the platform, so they just took it. They just took it down, couldn't get to it just because they can. And at some point, they'll take the Bible or they'll change it. So get you a good old <laughs> paper Bible. Genesis to Maps. Some of you older people understand that. Maps is not a book of the Bible, but. <laughs> so Matthew chapter 13, verses one through nine, Jesus is telling stories. He's always telling stories that people can relate to. On that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And a great multitude were gathered together to him because everywhere Jesus went, there was a multitude so that he got into a boat and he sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Come on, get the picture. You got to put yourself there. Put yourself right there in the moment. So many people, he's got to get in a boat and push off the bank or, or he's just going to get over, overrun. So he begins to speak to them in many parables saying, the first of which, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside The birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they they did not have much earth and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns and the thorns sprang up and choked them, but others fell on good ground. And yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So you have to imagine in this moment, these people have come out to to see the one who's been doing miracles, to see the, the one who we think he's the Messiah. We think the Messiah has finally showed up. There's so many people he has to get in a boat. He pushes off from the bank. And then as he pushes off from the bank, he begins to give them information that many of them already knew. Like, 
Because at this point, if you know the Bible, you know what he's talking about. But some of us aren't students of the Bible. And so you're looking at this going, why is Jesus talking to me about, about, about farming? Because up until this point, he like literally is. And so you know there's some people sitting there going, I came out, I walked all this way to hear something I already know. Like, I know if the seed falls here, it's not gonna, I know this, I know this. Let me warn you and let me challenge you. No matter how long you've been walking with the Lord, keep seeking him and reading the Bible and read it like you've never read it and read deeper and study deeper and make sure you hear what God is trying to say to you. Keep going. So we find ourselves, we know that, that Jesus is speaking of the seed being the word of God. So now we've identified that the, the heart, the soul, is the, the soil of the heart. The breastplate then protects the soil of the heart as to then allow us to walk out the journey of sanctification after salvation. It's so beautiful. But you're never gonna see the fruits of righteousness grow in your life without feeding your soul the word of God. You can't grow in Christ without reading his word. Because watch this, the imputed seed of righteousness at salvation is imputed into your spirit. Now your spirit is reborn. You're a new creation. God's spirit has invaded your spirit. Your life is no longer yours. The old is gone. The new has come. Therefore, all who are in Christ are a new creation. So now his spirit has invaded your spirit. You're saved. But your soul is is still looking and longing and thirsting. And so the spirit of God that now lives inside of you, watch this, is the same spirit that through men wrote this infallible book. So there is no way that you can feed the work of God in your spirit without feeding your soul the word of God. You gotta read your Bible. And you can't read your Bible to check the box. You got to read your Bible to hear from God. Oh, I wish I could hear from God. Oh, I wish I was spiritual enough to hear from God. Oh, I wish I was like so-and-so. Man, they're just always hearing from God. You better watch that. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Anybody ever give you a word that doesn't line up with his word? It's not a word. I've told you before, people have come to me, Pastor Jason, please ask God, to give you a word for me. And sometimes I'll just have fun with that. Sometimes I'll wait a whole week and I'll see them the next week and I'll say, hey, come here. And they just bounce up to you. And they're like, yeah. I said, I, God gave me a word for you. Well, what is it? He wants to talk to you. <laughs> That's the word. He wants to give you a word. And he's already given us a bunch of them. So let's start there. We don't need a prophet. We don't, we don't need a prophet coming down the aisles and saying, like, thus says the Lord. I mean, that's a gift. But why don't we start here? Thus says the Lord. There's a lot of pages where thus says the Lord. So you got to feed your soul the word of God because the spirit of God now lives, has overtaken your spirit and the imputed seed of righteousness has made your spirit righteous, but your soul still lives in this world and your soul longs for something. It thirsts for something. It, it pants for something and it's going to feed on something. See, the word of God, we won't go there, but it's Hebrews chapter four, verse 12. The Bible says, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, separating joint from marrow and spirit from soul. Judging, watch this, judging the very intent of the heart. And this is where the Christian journey gets fun because you will read the Bible and at some point it will make you uncomfortable. Because the Bible, well, that's why I said you, you may have heard that the church wants to tell you what's wrong with you and the church wants to judge you. No, that's not the church's 
we're, we, are, we are not to judge you. I trust the Bible enough. If we just teach the Bible, the Bible will do the job of saying, hey, Jason, this part of your life is off. Then I get the opportunity to submit to the word of God, the leading of God, the leading of his spirit in my life. Because it says it, it judges the, the very intent of the heart, the heart of the matter, the matter of the heart, the heart of the matter. So when I put the word of God, the seed of the word of God in, into the soil of my, my soul, my heart, then it, it begins to dissect the things in my heart that aren't like Jesus. Now watch this. And as the word of God dissects those things and those attitudes and those, those generational things that I've allowed to just kind of come along with me, I'm now adopted. I, I'm now a citizen of another kingdom and the word of God begins to, to tear away the layers of hurt and rejection and bitterness and anger. And, and now like the intent of my heart is being shown not to everyone else. Sometimes they already know it and you don't think they know it, but they know it. But between you and God. And now the, the matter of the heart is like, wow. I did not know that was in there. Thank you, Lord. Or we shut it up. Like, I'm saved. I'm good. There's no joy in that. There's no adventure in that. There's no getting back. I'm telling you, the last day church can't be a church that shuts their heart off to God when he, he begins to lead us by his spirit and lead us through his word. And he begins to dissect things, the, the, the matters of the heart and the heart of the matter. We have, to, we have to dive deep into that. That's what Ezekiel 47 was all about. We've got to get to a place where we lose control of what we think is comfortable. And we allow God through his spirit and through his word to dissect the things in our heart that are not like him and then willfully give them back over to him. Because when we do that, he then cultivates the fruits of righteousness in our life because the spirit of the word of God calls to the imputed spirit of righteousness and pulls it forward. And then guess what follows? The body. Because the body's the caboose. Always is. The body's gonna follow the soul. The soul is going to feed on something. I, I challenge you to let it feast on the word of God. So let's, let's keep going and, and look a little bit deeper at this. And so you'll look at this idea. Jesus stops the farming illustration. The disciples ask some questions that they should have already known the answer to. Jesus talks about some prophets and he says, Many people dreamed and yearned to hear what you're hearing. He then goes on to say, these people are proving Isaiah right. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they will not hear. And then he begins to break down the parable. Now, we won't make it all the way through the whole parable today. We'll pick it up next week but we're gonna stick with this idea of the heart. So you get to verse 18. So Jesus has this conversation with the disciples between verses nine and 18. So 10 through 17, they're going back and forth. And now Jesus begins to explain to the disciples, look, this is what the parable means. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, the word of the kingdom, I remember the exact day and the exact moment. I was teaching a men's Bible study years ago and I was teaching uh, on the importance of a man being a man of the word and knowing the word and it's not your wife's job. And I, I was like giving it to the men and I was really giving it to myself and I like, challenging myself. And because, and, you know, when we have our men's group, there's no holds bar, man. You just like, rah. So I never will forget. I'm like, I'm reading this. When he, anyone hears the word of the kingdom and it just exploded off the page. And I was like, wait a minute. The kingdom has a language. Now watch this. If my soul, 
My heart is the soil of my soul. And it's where I'm planting, it's longing, it needs to be watered, it needs to be fed, it needs to be cultivated. And if I am feeding my soul with the language of Babylon, then the word of the kingdom is never gonna take root because the kingdom has a language. I'll give you some examples. Crow, you getting this? Watch this, I'll give you some examples. To find it, you gotta lose it. To find your life, you gotta lose it, right? It's like your keys. <laughs> How many of you just lose your keys all the time? And where do you find them? The last place you look. So, like, the last shall be first. That is totally wrong, Jesus. No. I work hard. I've done this. I've done that. I pulled myself up. Ah, 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 ah. No, no, no. He, 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 he. There's a language of the kingdom. There's a submission. There, when, when one hears the word of the kingdom, that's why Matthew 6, says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. There is a language of the world and there's a language of the kingdom. And for far too long, the church has been caught in this gray area of on Sunday or Saturday night for an hour and a half, I'll, I'll learn, I will speak kingdom language. How you doing, brother? Good, good, good. I'll say amen at the right time. I'll raise my hands at the right time. I'll look the right way. I'll do this, I'll do that. And I will look like I belong in this kingdom because this kingdom only is these four walls. But friend, this kingdom, uh-uh. You, when you're born again, the Bible says you are now a citizen of another kingdom. And if you try, listen to me, if you ever been to a third world country and ate something you, you thought you should eat and you ate it and it made you sick, why? Because your body was not used to processing what it, you just put in it. Because you're not, you don't live there. You're not a citizen of that place. Now you say stay for a couple months and you, you eat and drink the water and you eat slowly and drink the water and you eat slowly and drink the water. Your body, because God, you know, your body is the most amazing thing ever. Um, you, you will, your body will shift into a mode where you could eat enough of it and you won't get sick because you've stayed long enough, my God. You have stayed long enough in that place. Let's call it a kingdom. And now your body has, has morphed into being at home in that kingdom. For far too long, we have relegated being kingdom people to Saturday night or Sunday morning and we get really good at acting out being a kingdom person, but Monday through Saturday, baby, that's mine. I'm gonna get what's mine, and, and I'm gonna speak Babylonian. And when I say Babylon, I just mean the ways of this world. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let my opinions be known. I'm, I, I'm gonna, you're mean to me, I'm gonna be mean to you. You come at me, I'm coming back at you. You point a gun at me, I'm gonna point five at you. Oh, wait a minute. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. How, do, how does all that relate? No. See, if we're really gonna go down this path and we're really gonna pray that God does miracles in our hearts, that he's gotta have all of us. And we can't just speak kingdom at church or when we're, we're like, you know, some of you, let's say you golf. Some of you golf with church folk sometimes and some of you golf with unchurched folk, and you should. But some of you, when you're golfing with church folk, you'd be like, four! <laughs> and some of you, we drive, drive, fiddlesticks! <laughs> you see what I mean? See the dichotomy? I mean, I'm calling myself, like, I'm not calling myself out, but like, that's, that's just a funny illustration of how we unconsciously 
separate who we are. Look, we're either children of God or we're not. We're either born again or we're not. We're either citizens of another kingdom, a new kingdom, or we're not. We're either a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, or not. We're either joint heirs with Christ, or we're not. We're either the head and not the tail, or we're not. He's, he who began a good work in us is gonna complete it to the day of Christ Jesus, or he's not. We don't, and he is, my friend, but he needs all of us. So the word of the kingdom, Psalms 1, 1 through 3, I don't know if I get through all, all the verses here, but life verse of mine, you, you know this. Blessed is the man, blessed, blessed is the man. This man is, he is in right standing with God and at peace. That's what blessed means. And also remember righteousness, God's standard to be right in his sight, to be made right in the eyes of. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, the language of the world, nor stands in the way of the sinner, the ways of the world. It's the language of this world. It's the priorities of this world. Those of you who are raising kids, your kids are getting older, I'm telling you, you can tell them all you want that God's important and church is important and serving God is important, but they, they don't hear what you say, they see what you do. Priorities, like priorities are seen by your actions. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the ways of this world, the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. In other words, hangs out in a state of anxiousness, anxiety, anger at what, what Babylon is doing in Babylon. <laughs> and then you're up at 2 a.m. On, on whatever social media platform you have and you're letting the whole world know that you're speaking on Jesus' behalf and they're wrong. <laughs> Why? Because you've had this input of, of language and you're not created to process that language. You're a new creation. And so now your spirit is, is getting things from your soul. Your soul is getting things from the world and your spirit is throwing that back up. Because the imputed seed of righteousness in your spirit doesn't want to have anything to do with the ways of this world. So now you got spiritual food poisoning because the input, you, you're, not a, you don't, you're not made for it. Did that make sense? But his or her delight is in, don't get caught up on the word law because we read the Old Testament through New Testament lens. But his delight is in the word of God. And in that word, he or she meditates day and night for they shall be planted like a tree beside streams of living water, bearing forth their fruit and every season fruit, fruits of righteousness and everything he or she does shall prosper. Why? Because I'm not meditating on the things of this world because I'm allowing those things into my soul. What you allow into your soul is what you're gonna meditate on and what you meditate on is, is what's gonna grow. You, you, what you feed the longest because the strongest, but they, right here in Psalms, it says, he who meditates on the word of God day and night shall be planted like a tree beside streams of living water, bearing forth his fruit in every season. If you're in this room right now, you're watching online and God has blessed you and, and you've grown a business and you, you have like, God, God's just like really blessed you, right? And you're like, you know, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm good at what I do. Can I just encourage you, first of all, give your business to God if you're, if you're a child of God, and then begin to read the word of God, apply the word of God to your business and watch him do what only he can do. You think it's, it's good now? Give it to him. Apply it. This, this is the best leadership book ever written. Hands down. Why? Because when I meditate on this, the Bible promises me that what I do will prosper from the inside out. From the inside out. 
the rest of that Psalms passage is in, in your notes for your reference. So Matthew 13, 19, let's read the rest of that. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. So now Jesus is breaking it down. Like I wasn't talking about corn. I wasn't talking about wheat. I wasn't talking about barley. I'm talking about the word of God, that living, active word of God that judges the intent of the heart. So when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who who received seed by the wayside. What Jesus is trying to convey to the disciples right here is that, and does not understand it, when the word of the kingdom comes into the soil that has been feeding on the things of Babylon, it cannot relate. So it never falls deep. It never, this, this amazes me right here. Watch this. The wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown where? So we know it got to the heart. That, that's the crazy part. That's the revelation to me. I, I don't know that I've ever really dug so far into this. I've always thought, you know, the trampled down ground just didn't get to the heart. No, it got to the heart. But when it got to the heart, the soil of the heart did not understand it because it had been feeding off things that it wasn't supposed to be feeding off of because you're living like the soul is now, like the spirit is going, no. No, we don't know. And now the soul of the heart, it's hard. So here's the application here. Are there places in our hearts that we could actually say, you know what, that's wayside. I've not given that, I've not given that to God yet. I don't think any of us should ever live a day where we don't challenge ourselves to ask the Lord, Lord, do you have all of me? I can't say that I I, I do that every day, but we should. Because if he doesn't have all of us, he can't do all that he wants in us. And it's so profound that we understand that the, the word reached the heart, but the wicked one was able to come. Why? Because the soul had not been feeding off truth. So the belt of truth was slid a little bit. So the breastplate wasn't covering the process. So the seed gets sown to the heart and the wicked one's able to come with that fiery dart because the breastplate has shifted, remember, because the belt of truth holds the breastplate in place. And now, if you're reading your Bible and you're reading your Bible just to check the box, God knew from the foundation of this earth, watch this, you could be going through hell on earth but you're reading your Bible, and you're checking the box, and you're doing your Bible app, and you've got, you know, you're you know, four weeks in a row, you haven't missed, and you're, and from the foundations of the earth, God knew you would be reading that scripture that day. But if you're reading it to check the box, and your input is more from the, the things of this world, you will miss the message of the word of the kingdom and the seed that could have set you free with the wisdom of God through the word of God and could have totally revolutionized your situation and the spirit is screaming. Your spirit is screaming to your soul. Stop, listen, listen. God is speaking. He is speaking. This is the answer to your situation. This will bring peace. But you are so, you're so overwhelmed with the input of the world and you got to finish checking the box on the Bible app so you can go on and deal with the problem that you're dealing with that's got you so stressed out. And you, you can totally miss the revelation that God is trying to give you through his spirit that wrote this book that would set you free from your circumstance. Oh, that we would be a people 
What if it took, so what if it takes you five years to read the Bible through? But you read it. Yes. You experience. How many of you have ever been, been on vacation and, and you just wanted vacation to go, like a good vacation? I'm not talking about family reunion, but <laughs> you wanted the vacation to just, you wanted the vacation just to keep going, right? Right, you didn't want to come home. Yeah, like, see if we can stay another day. See if you can change the flight, right? See, let's just see, just one more day. Just, just one more day, just one more day. Like, let's just stay one more. You don't go on vacation if it's really a good, relaxing, fun vacation and say, okay, we gotta get through with this vacation. We gotta check this bus, we gotta check this bus. That's not vacation. That's not what God has for you in his word. Slow down, read the word of God. Let him speak to you. Don't let the wicked one come and snatch it away. What's the process for this? I'm so glad you asked. Joel chapter two, verses 12 through 17. This is the amplified version. And this is my prayer for myself, my family, and for this church. This is my prayer that we would be a people that head in this direction. Therefore, also now says the Lord, turn and keep coming to me with all of your heart. Turn, listen, you may have heard me say, they hear the word and they don't understand it. And you might be going, you know what, Pastor Jason, I've been reading the Bible and I don't understand it. I just got saved and I don't understand it. It's okay. It's okay. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to those of us who've walked with the Lord for a while. You just, this is what you need to do. Turn and keep coming. Turn and keep coming. Listen, if we'll be a people that will turn our hearts away from the things of this world and keep coming after Jesus. Jesus does not desire to play hide and seek. Right? He, you take one step, he'll take a million. Like, he, he wants you to come. Turn and keep on coming to me. With what? With all of your heart. With all of your heart. Come to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, until every, watch this, until every hindrance is removed and the broken fellowship is restored. Let's keep going. Rend your hearts and not your garments. What, why is that important? When the Old Testament, if someone wanted to put on a, a show of mourning, they would tear their garments. And God says, I don't care what you do on the outside. I want your heart. Like, open your heart. Rend, open your heart to me. He says, I'm gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He revokes the sentence of evil. When his conditions are met, what are his conditions? His conditions are for us to turn and keep coming. We're not always gonna get it right. The conditions of the law were met by Jesus. He's asking us right here, just, hey, Jason, just turn and keep coming after me. I know it's costing some time, but I promise you it's gonna be worth it. Just turn and keep coming. Turn and, with all of your heart. Oh man, when's the last time that you just took a block of time and got rid, put the phone on airplane mode if, if you listen to worship music when you spend time with God or, or you look up Bible words, but you just got alone with God and you said, Lord, for the next hour or eight hours or whatever it is, God, I'm gonna come after you and I'm not gonna quit until I know that I've met with you. It's the only way. It's the only way the marriage is saved. It's the only way the kids come back to Jesus. It's the only way. It's the only way the church survives the last days. It's turning hard back to him with all that's in us. Nothing else is more important than Lord. I will seek you and I'm gonna find you and I'm not, I will not quit until I know that we've met. And, the, and that's not goosebumps, and that's not a church service, man. That's why it's called a personal relationship. See, this is so far out there for some of you guys. Like, you're, Pastor Jason, I, I think you've, you're going to a place I'm just not willing to go. This, this used to be a cool church. 
Oh man, cool church isn't gonna get you through the persecution we're gonna endure in the last days. Our children, our grandchildren. No, it, it, no it's just not. Let's keep going. Who knows, but he will turn, revoke your sentence of evil and leave a blessing behind him. Verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion, set apart a fast, a day of restraint and humility. Call a solemn assembly. You know you can do that by yourself. This doesn't speak to that, but you can do that by yourself. This is speaking to the people of God. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elderly people, gather the children. In other words, everyone. You pull everyone together, tell them to turn back to me and follow me with their whole hearts. The heart is so important. We, we've looked at Hosea 10, 12 throughout this process, but I slid it in right here. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, Break up the hard ground of your heart for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. Seek the Lord, Joel 2, verse 12 and 13. Turn and keep coming to me with all of your heart. Verse 18 of Joel chapter two, or verse 20, I'm sorry but I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive it into a barren and desolate land. Verses 20, 21, and 22 speak to the fact that the wicked one that would come to rob and snatch the seed, God will turn away. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Verse 23, be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord. Zion, children of Zion, that's us. And rejoice in the Lord your God, for he gives you the former and early rain in just measure and in. And he causes to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain as before. In other words, if you'll turn your heart back to him and you'll come after him and you'll keep coming after him, he will send a rain upon your life that will wash away the anger, the hurt, the bitterness, and it will break up the fallow ground. You can't be in the presence of God and continue to be prideful. It's impossible. Then he says in verse 24, this is what I'm gonna do for you if you'll come after me. And the threshing floor shall be full of grain and the vat shall overflow with juice of the grape and oil. Verse 25, and I, I believe with all of my heart that this is such a word for the church of today, but I don't pastor the entire church. I just pastor Coastline, so hear this. If you'll do this, I will restore or replace for you the years that the locust has eaten. The hopping locust, the stripping locust, and the crawling locust. My, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame and you shall know, understand and realize that I am, I am in the midst of my people Israel and that I the Lord am your God and there is none else. My people shall never be put to shame and afterward I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Listen to me. On the day of Pentecost, this is Joel chapter two, Acts chapter two, Peter said, this is what Joel spoke of. And it hasn't stopped since. Why did it happen that day? Because there were a group of people who turned. That same Peter who failed miserably by the fire, 
he got up in front of those same people that crucified Jesus with boldness and preached the gospel because he turned his whole heart. The end of the book of John, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? You know I do, Lord. Peter, do you love me? You know I do, Lord. Peter, do you love me? Three times. Why did he ask him three times? Because Peter denied him three times. Jesus restored him. Your past does not have to determine your future. Here's the key. Just turn. Just turn. Pastor Jason, it can't be that easy. It's not that easy because the enemy hates giving up territory. But you can do it. The power of God lives in you if you've given your heart to Jesus. You can do it. Jesus came out of the grave. That same spirit that rose Christ from the grave. That same spirit. Some of you in this room right now, you're like, I cannot turn from pornography. It's too strong. I can't do it. Every time I try, I just keep going back. I just, I say I'm not gonna do it and I do it. You can overcome that. You might not be able to, but the power of the spirit of God, if you've put your faith in Jesus, the imputed seed of right, you can live free from that. Oh, freedom. Freedom. What an incredible thing to even think about. I hope you go back this week and you look at these notes and you read through Joel chapter two and you give some real thought to the condition of your heart because the condition of your heart will be proven and evident by the things that you are allowing into your heart. I'm not talking about something someone did to you. I'm talking about everyday noise, everyday noise, everyday noise. Let his voice be the loudest this week. Read this word like it's his love letter to you because it is. Take him at his word. Bow your heads, all this place. Before we're dismissed today, I know like largely this message is, is was two Christians and those of us who've been walking with the Lord, but maybe you're here today and you can't, you can't point to a moment in time where you've put your faith in Jesus Christ. You heard me talk about the imputed seed of righteousness. You heard me talk about being a new creation and something went off in your spirit, like in your, in your knower. And you're like, you know what? I, I've, I don't, I can't point to a, a moment in time where I've ever been saved. Like I've, where I put my faith in Jesus. The Bible says that when you put your faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, your faith, and no one can do this for you. No one can sprinkle you. No one can tell you it happened to you when you were a baby. No, it's your faith. And only you can put your faith where your faith goes. So if you would say today, I've never put my faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, but I feel him, I feel him dealing with me now. I wanna do that today. I need to be saved. I can't see you online. But if you're in this room, will you slip your hand up? I wanna pray with you. I need to accept Christ. Yes. Yeah. That is so awesome. Praise the Lord. Yes. Yes. God is so good. You know, there are those Sundays or Saturday nights and people raise their hand. They raise them and they wave. That was this morning. You guys are waving at me. Pray this with me, and then when I dismiss, come to one of the corners, whether you're upstairs or downstairs, and, and let us get you a Bible and, and just love on you for a minute. But if you're online and you know this is you, pray this with me. God, thank you for loving me so much that you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, to die for me. He took my place on the cross. And right now, God, I, I receive the gift of salvation through what Jesus did for me. And I'm putting my faith in Jesus as the Messiah. And I'm confessing for myself that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. I believe for myself that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. I believe for myself that Jesus Christ died on the cross. He was murdered. He died for me. I believe he was placed in a tomb dead. And on the third day, he came back to life through the power of your spirit, God. So right now, I receive the work of Christ into my life. Thank you that I'm a new creation. Thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. And thank you, Lord, that the weight of the world is lifting off my shoulders right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, stand up with me. Prayer team's coming forward. If you got saved, we celebrate with you. We are so proud of you. Oh, come on. You can do better than that. Yeah. Yes. Don't forget tomorrow night, may the Lord bless you and keep you and his face shine upon you and everything you do this week prosper. Amen. Love you.